by six. Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to Homesteading Off the Grid. It's October 21st as of this recording, and it's time for another tale from October Nights, part two. 31 more tales for the Halloween season. Uh, doing a double take here because I was droning on and on with the story behind the story. It's October 21. The story is called Sins of Our Fathers. The story behind this story is basically that about a year or so ago, I was at a social event, and I'll leave it at that, and I had the unpleasant... Uh, listen, here's the point. Opportunity presents itself everywhere, even in undesirable situations. This undesirable situation I was in was that I was sat at a table with a member of one of Virginia's first families who... And I know several others are very humble. They're good people. They're down to earth. They'll they'll help you. And if you didn't know, they were uh, worth hundreds of millions and some of them billions of dollars. You'd never know because they're just real people. This guy was not one of them. Uh, this guy just droned on and on for hours. He was on like a 45-minute loop that he got through about two and a half, two and three-fourths of the times. Um, his importance, his family's importance, who was married to... George Washington's first cousin and who married Cornwallis's sister and how many hundreds of thousands of acres they own from Georgia to Connecticut and something like uh, at one point he said if you farm less than 5,000 acres you're a hobbyist and I don't think he's ever touched a seed in his life he pays others to do it of course but it was funny here's the good part about it the, the funny part the part that I thought was ironic um, see, I used to be a financial planner. I used to work with people who had money. And I found that there's two types of wealthy people. There are those who are born into it. And there are those who create wealth on their own in the course of their lifetime. If I had to pick who I was going to work with, even though most of the people that I worked with that were what we called trust fund babies were wonderful, wonderful people, uh, I would almost always pick the self-made because they are even more humble uh, they don't tend to talk about their self-importance, but from them you can learn lessons. They can tell you about the things they did that, that didn't work out, things that set them back. They can tell you about things they did that did work out in their strive to become successful. Uh, and you can really learn. Uh, this, is, But, again, there's opportunity presented in every situation. After about halfway through this guy's loop that he was on the first time around, I thought, you know, there's a story here. So I listened and I thought, you know, there's a story here. Well, this is that story. But I want to, I want to, before I get into the story, there at the very end as the party was disrupting, and, and some of my friends I was with were, they're millionaires and they're the self made kind, the kind that you would never guess as they're sitting around in their ratty, you know, New England Patriots sweatshirts that they've had since college that they put on every day on game day. Uh, you'd never guess it because they're just not arrogant pricks, okay? Uh, but the guy says something at the end. He goes, because uh, he was talking about all the affluent people in our area. He goes, you know, there's only one type of rich person I hate. And I said, well, what, what type is that? And he goes, the self-made, self-made millionaires. I hate those bastards. And me and my friends were like looking at each other. And I was like, well, why is that? He goes, because they want to tell you about how important they are. Oh, I was born poor. I was born in West Virginia. Or I was born in Alabama. And my parents quit high school. And look, I did that. Now I live here and I've got this. He goes, they're just so damn arrogant. He says, when you're born rich, you don't need to go around telling everybody how rich you are. Because we already know we're rich. And then he just got up and left. And I looked at my friends and I was like, didn't this guy just spend the last two and a half hours telling us how rich he is? So anyway, that's the story behind this story. But from a lot of the history of that first family affluence, past, etc., we got a gem, and it's tonight's tale. Sins of our fathers. <clears throat> the Buxtons, what a nice New England trust fund baby name, huh? Not the dude's real name, okay? The Buxtons were to have Thanksgiving at the, at the estate of their ancestors in Virginia. The estate, built on land granted to them by King James directly, remained in the family still these many centuries later, and it was customary for the family to gather at the original estate just outside of the small town of Shenandoah at least once every 10 years. And this Thanksgiving was to be that 10-year reunion. The Buxtons were gathering, however, 
this year for Thanksgiving at the Connecticut estate of Jude and Edith Buxton. Proud parents of Daniel Buxton, a sprouting young 12 years of age, this because of what had happened at the Virginia estate this past summer. Events which young Daniel Buxton related to his proud parents upon their return from their summer trip to the south of France. Fantastic events neither Jude nor Edith Buxton believed until their southern cousin, Winston Buxton, confirmed the events, having seen the irrefutable proof of young Daniel Buxton's conjectures nearly a month before this year's Thanksgiving festivities on Halloween night. Exactly what happened is recorded below. Daniel Buxton had been to the estate of his cousins in Shenandoah, Virginia once before, though he could not remember the visit. It had been for a large Thanksgiving gathering when he'd still been in diapers. His parents were to summer in the south of France this year and love young Daniel as they did. They simply didn't want to be inconvenienced by having a child along with them. They'd made arrangements for him to stay with his distant cousins in Virginia, reckoning the south of anywhere would be a nice summer retreat. The family's land in Virginia, though once vast, still consisted of several thousands of acres. A couple dozen households of Virginia First Family descendants inhabited the land, and though their land might have dwindled in acreage, they enjoyed the compounding of their overall wealth. Though no currently living Buxton could be blamed for the sins of the fathers, namely the sins of owning other human beings for centuries, and having said human beings work at times to their deaths to compound the family's wealth by way of tobacco and cotton farming, they felt not a single need to voluntarily pay restitution in any form or redistribute their wealth in any way, and they did neither, and hence their fortune had grown immensely over the years. The land that was left, the more liquid assets, the family businesses, the entire mega fortune, which compounded year after year, decade after decade, and century after century, remained locked tight in untouchable trust, and many within the family, though they would never state it publicly, though they certainly implied it publicly with every air about themselves, felt as if they truly were God's chosen people. So, as they saw it, what did reparations of any kind in any way or any form of redistribution of wealth have anything to do with them? <clears throat> Young Daniel Buxton was easygoing, never speaking out of turn, and he learned from an early age that, at least in his household and the households of the rest of his vast Virginia First family, Children were to be seen sometimes, but never heard. As such, he carried this quiet demeanor with him for the summer to Virginia, as he did everywhere, and so on the first day of his arrival, it was no surprise to his distant cousin Winston, who was Daniel's parents' age, nor Winston's wife, Sabrina, who was the same age as Winston and Daniel's parents as well, that he spoke but little. He'll open up in time, Sabrina had said to Winston on that first night after Daniel had gone off to bed in one of the guest rooms of the old antebellum farmhouse, and Winston had shrugged his shoulders as if he cared not whether he did or not, or whether he didn't. Sabrina, you see, had married into the family. Daniel was awakened the following morning by the sound of gunfire, three successive shotgun blasts. He glanced at his iPhone and saw that the hour was nearly noon, so he jumped out of bed and went downstairs and into the living room where he saw Winston and Sabrina staring out at the large, out of the large front window of the living room. They were looking across the road. There was a nearly equally old farmhouse on the other side of the road, and the house and property, though once upon a time part of the family estate, was no longer. It had been sold off to satisfy a gambling debt of one of the less desirable Buxtons years before, who was then summarily excommunicated from the family, though he still had access to his trust funds, so he cared not. Do you think I'd better go check on him? Winston asked Sabrina. Perhaps, she said. Oh, they both said in unison as they turned and saw young Daniel behind them. Good morning, sleepyhead, Sabrina said, and she rubbed Daniel's head and he liked it. His mother rarely touched him. She showed no affection and even when she tried, Daniel knew it wasn't genuine. Later in life, he would be able to put into words that which he couldn't as a child, but which he'd always felt. That being that he'd merely been brought into the world to continue a bloodline and hence maintain a wealth line. What's going on? Daniel asked his cousins. Hunting? No, Winston said. It's summer. It's not hunting season, but it's not uncommon to hear, hear gunfire any time of year around here because we are out in the country and people often target practice or shoot skeet, but it is uncommon to hear gunfire from across the road. 
After pacing in front of the window and sporadically gazing out of it for a short period, Winston spoke again saying, I'm going to go make sure he's okay. While Winston was checking on the neighbor across the road, Sabrina filled young Daniel in on the backstory of the neighbor. In order for him to fully understand the significance of the oddity of the gunfire. The man across the road, one Peter Jenkins, was a nature-loving, peace-loving, everything in existence except his fellow man-loving hippie. He was nearing his 60th year and he'd lived across from the Buxtons for 20 of those years. The Buxtons actually, at least a set of Buxtons made up of Winston and Sabrina Buxton, were the only humans known by any other humans who were actually on speaking terms with Peter Jenkins, and even at that, it was only the occasional hello and goodbye, when one or the other would see the other one or the other coming and going. Peter Jenkins did not hunt, nor did he allow anyone else to hunt on his land. His entire property was clearly posted, and until the gunshots now in question, the Buxtons would not have imagined he had even owned a firearm. It stood to reason, though, as they saw it, and after having heard the shots, because he would need something with which to shoot a trespasser or a poacher. Just as Sabrina was finishing up the backstory on Peter Jenkins and laying a plate of scrambled eggs and toast before young Daniel, who'd been sitting at the table listening intently while his cousin was cooking his breakfast and telling her story, Winston came back into the house. That was weird, he said, walking over to the sink and washing what appeared to be fresh mud off of his hands. What's going on, Sabrina asked. He said he was in the kitchen, Winston said, now drying his hands on a dish towel. And he looked out the window and he saw a man, a black man, with two chickens, one under each arm, struggling to get out of his pond. What? Sabrina and Daniel said in unison. Yeah, Winston said. And you know, Sabrina, it's all dried up, the pond, so it's really a mud pit like all the other ponds and rivers. And anywhere there's supposed to be water with this damn drought and all. Sabrina shot Winston a stern look for his choice of words. Sorry, he said, looking at Daniel. We're having the worst drought this summer in the recorded history of the state of Virginia, he continued. We had a dry winter, and then it didn't rain once at all this spring. Here we are, well into June, and everything's dried up. Daniel nodded, showing his understanding, but Winston knew that since Daniel had no experience with farming, there was no way he could truly understand the predicament that the Virginia farmers statewide were truly in. Anyway, Winston continued, Jenkins said he looked or said he took his 12 gauge pump shotgun out there and yelled, get the getting and shot three warning shots in the air. But he said when the smoke cleared, the man with the chickens under his arms was gone. Where did he go? Sabrina and Daniel asked together. That's just it, Winston said, sitting down at the table before speaking again. It's as if he would completely vanished. Winston told his company that Jenkins and he had walked over to the dried pond, which was nothing more than a mud pit, as he'd already explained, and they could clearly see signs of a struggle. There were, there were footprints, and one could clearly tell where someone had been sinking, up to their knees at least, in the soft mud. There were even a few chicken feathers lying about. And Jenkins doesn't even have chickens, Winston said. He went on and explained how it appeared as if someone or something had just been dropped right out of the sky and into the dried up pot pond and had then attempted to escape the mud pit and then simply vanished into the same thin air from which they'd come. Over the next couple of weeks, young Daniel Buxton from Connecticut would learn just how much he loved summer in Virginia. He'd taken up with a few kids his age, both boys and girls and all distant, distant cousins, and they taught him the fine arts of catching crawdads in the creeks, at least what was left of the creeks, wading in the rivers, at least to the ankles, and since there was not enough water left in them for swimming, climbing steep hills and the occasional not so steep rock outcroppings, swinging from grapevine, grapevines and his personal favorite, capturing those brightly lit bugs in the, field, in the fields at night and putting them into glass jars to create the most amazing night lights possible. Night after night, young Daniel would fall to sleep watching the flashing cur jar on his nightstand and morning after morning he would awaken to a jar of dead bugs, all which would be summarily replaced with living bugs in the coming evening. Alas, after two weeks, young Daniel was awakened around midnight by the sound of one single gun blast. He, he could tell it had come from a distance much farther away than the house across the road. 
What he'd actually heard had been the echo of a high-powered rifle, so the sound carried quite a distance. Thinking nothing of it, for he was still half asleep, young Daniel looked over, saw only one flashing bug in his jar, and then went back to sleep entirely. The next morning, when he ran down the stairs in such a way he'd never done back at his Connecticut estate, he had actually in his very early youth, and he'd been admonished for so doing and had never done it since, until this summer in Virginia, excited to meet up with the other kids for a day of whatever fun they had in store for him, he walked in on the conversation taking place between Winston and Sabrina. He said he shot him center mass, Winston said, right in the chest, knocked him off the horse. He said he saw him fall, but then he and the horse were both just gone. Winston, only after saying this last, noticed that Daniel had, had entered the room. Feeling he had to fill in the gaps so Daniel wouldn't be scared from only having heard part of the story, he did so, fearing afterward that he may have made matters worse in doing so. Winston explained that he had driven up to his cousin Parker's house just after daybreak to inquire as to what had required being shot at with a high-powered rifle the night before. As it turned out, cousin Parker, who was one of the most obsessed horse people in the family, feared the night before that he was being robbed of one of his prized thoroughbreds, a horse that had actually ran in not one and not even two, but three Kentucky Derby races. I looked out the window when I got up to use the bathroom, Parker had told Winston, and I saw with my own eyes a son of a bitch trying to make off with Fat Chance Sally. Parker told Winston he'd immediately gone into his bedroom and grabbed his Remington 243. He'd gone out the back door and there about 50 yards away was someone on horseback struggling to get himself and the horse he was on out of the pond, which like all the others due to the drought had become little more than a mud pit. I aimed small right at his chest, Parker had said, and when I squeezed off my shot, I saw the son of a bitch fall and the horse fell over on its side. Is Fat Chance Sally okay? Winston had asked. Well, that's just it, Parker had said. It wasn't Sally. It wasn't any of them. There wasn't a horse in the pond. Parker said he'd run up to the edge of the pond, flashlight in hand, and he looked all around only to find that the horse and the thief he'd shot off of its back were both gone. Winston and Parker had gone out to have another look around that morning after, and just like before in the old hippie's pond across the road, there were clearly signs of a struggle. They could see the prints left behind by horse hooves and a few footprints left behind by a person, and they could even see the large indentation in the mud where a horse had apparently fallen, and only a few feet away from that, the indentation left by the man who'd fallen off of the horse's back. But that had been it. No horse, no man. And every single one of Parker's thoroughbreds were accounted for. Not a single one of them had left their stalls the night before. Not even Fat Chance Sally. It was the last night that young Daniel Buxton from Connecticut was to spend in Shenandoah, Virginia for the summer, as his parents had returned from the south of France, that was the most terrifying. It was the night that would cause certain conjectures to form in young Daniel's mind, conjectures that his parents would claim were impossibilities and which they would demand he never speak of, especially if in the company of others, again. Until, of course, the upcoming Halloween night with which we began our story. The time of these events on that hot summer night in Virginia was 3 o'clock a.m., the true witching hour. This, as we all know, because the devil himself had mocked the Trinity. Daniel was awakened, lightly at first, and so lightly that he thought he was dreaming, by the sounds of bells. Cling, cling here, clang, clang there, here a cling, there a clang, everywhere a cling, clang. He sat up, now fully awake. Daniel slipped out of bed and made his way to the window, which overlooked the back field, where in the middle, 50 yards away from the house, was the pond. The moon was full and the sky was clear of clouds, so Daniel was able to see nearly as well as if it were day, and what he saw ever so clearly, was what appeared to be no less than half a dozen men struggling for all they were worth to get out of the pond, which, like all the other ponds around, was little more than a mud pit. There was something different about these men, however, and it was that difference, Daniel determined, that was causing the sound which had awakened him. It appeared as if all the men in the pond were wearing some sort of metal collar around their necks, and extending from these collars for lengths of about a foot were metal rods. Upon the ends of these metal rods hung bells. What the? Daniel said, trailing off just as the sound of gunfire went off below him. He peered straight down from the window and saw Winston running out, firing round after round toward the pond. He continued watching as Winston reached the pond, shotgun still at his shoulder, and began looking around for nothing. 
Daniel walked downstairs and met up with Sabrina, who'd been watching from the back door. Together, and with each of, each of them taking flashlights, they went outside and joined Winston at the pond's edge. You can see where they were, Winston said, sharing his flat, shining his flashlight into the soft mud of the pond's bottom. All in attendance could clearly see where there had been a struggle. There were footprints, indentations where the men had sank up to their knees in mud, indentations from where some of the men had fallen repeatedly in their desperate attempts to escape their fates. Having accidentally kicked something with the side of his foot while moving around, shining his light on the tracks in the mud, young Daniel bent over and picked up something metal. It appeared to be an old collar with a bar and a bell. What's this, he said, handing the contraption to Sabrina. She took it, shined her light on it, and said, Oh my God. Let's get back inside, Winston said, having seen the contraption, and they did. You're about to learn some history you probably didn't know, folks. Winston had explained to Daniel after the trio had gotten back inside one of the ugly truths about our nation's past and in particular about the Buxton family ancestors. Yes, they had been plantation owners, which meant that yes, they had been slave owners. It was a conversation that no one in the family ever had, openly at least, with each other and certainly not with anyone from outside the family. If a slave were to run away, Winston explained to young Daniel, and then they were later captured, they would be brought back to the plantation and beaten to within an inch of their lives. Then, he continued, despite the look of total terror on his young listener's face, their owners would weld this metal collar with the bell on it around their neck. They would wear this for the rest of their lives, which usually wasn't long. This was so that if they attempted to escape again, it would be easy to hear where they were going. How did they sleep, Daniel asked, with a contraption like that around their neck? There would be no way they could lie down. Sitting up and very little, Sabrina said, a tear falling down the right side of her face as she did. Ghosts, Daniel said, barely audible. What? Winston said, looking up at Daniel, trying to whip up a tear himself, but alas, he couldn't, because in truth, he had zero empathy. Realizing this terrified him more than the thought of ghosts. Was he really that insensitive to the plight? His ancestors, flesh and blood family members from the past had instilled upon so many other human beings? He chose not to answer that question in his mind, fear, fearing the answer would only heighten his sense of terror. Ghosts, Daniel said. It's all clearly obvious now. All these people everyone's been seeing and shooting at all summer. They've all been ghosts. Ghosts of the family's past. Slaves. People our ancestors would have viewed as no more than chicken thieves or horse thieves. But they were really people who were probably hungry because they were never fed enough food or who were, who were, or who were merely trying to get away to freedom. Our ancestors just killed them at will, buried them in a gully, and then dammed up the gully to build a pond, and no one was ever the wiser of any of it. Not like they would have cared anyway. Winston and Sabrina looked at each other. Neither of them spoke a word, not because they believed Daniel's explanation was too fantastic to believe, rather because they believed he was right. The next day, as Daniel made the long drive home from Virginia to Connecticut with his parents, he counted farm ponds along the way, and as the count got higher and higher, he became both more and more heartbroken and more and more terrified. It was around the large stone hearth of the fireplace of the beautiful Connecticut man's and after everyone had had their fill of turkey and gravy and all the fixings, that Cousin Winston told the details of the events which had taken place less than a month before on Halloween night. Rain, he said, his voice full of passion. It started at midnight, and it was announced by the loudest clap of thunder you've ever heard. All in attendance were leaning forward in their seats, hanging on Winston's words. Why, Winston said, the older folks were saying it hadn't rained like that since the end of the last serious drought, a generation before. Come to think of it, they said that that one had happened on Halloween night as well. And it had rained so hard that night that many dams had burst and they had to be rebuilt. What Winston didn't tell them, because he didn't know, was that that storm he'd referred to, the storm from a generation before, had been the very storm that would breach the dam of a certain pond roughly 50 miles to the south of their Shenandoah estate on a Virginia farm previously owned by a very insecure school teacher who'd been married to a man she'd allegedly sent packing for his infidelities, 
a man named Gimpy, whose skeletal remains were found after the dam of said pond had given way and the pond had drained. Remember that story from a couple weeks ago? Everyone in the valley was overjoyed, Winston continued. Despite this late hour, everyone jumped out of bed. We went outside, we danced in the rain, we fell onto the ground and we rolled around in the wet grass. Winston paused. He looked around the room and made eye contact one by one with all in attendance. He had their full attention and he knew it. So he said, and then we saw them. Who? The single word said by all, though they already knew the answer. It wasn't the first time any of them had heard the story, hence the changing of the location of the Thanksgiving dinner, but they simply couldn't get enough of the tale. The ghosts, Winston said, and no one even whispered a reply. Nay, there was not even a gasp of shock or surprise. And there certainly were no signs of disbelief for as many times as they'd already heard the story, it had not changed once in its telling. The ghosts who represent the sins of our fathers, Winston said. One by one and score by score, they came out of the ponds. As the water levels rose, so did their numbers. It's as if a portal to the past or the other side of what we think of as reality was opened. And they came through the opening. Winston stopped. He stood still and silent for nearly half a minute, during which time no one spoke. The only sound heard in the room were the sounds being made by the crackling fire. And then they were gone, Winston said when he finally spoke again, into the mist. A heavy fog that was forming from the cool rain meeting the warm earth. The steam and fog rose and the ghosts rose with it. And they became a single entity and they lifted and they lifted. And then we could see the open space between the fog and the spirits within the fog and the ground beneath. And then that wave of wronged humanity and spirit form and the fog which encased it rose until both disappeared into the darkness above us all and we could see them no more. And it continued to rain, and people began to weep. And everyone in the living room of that large Connecticut manse wept, even this time, having had more time to think about the sins of the fathers, Winston. The end. Folks, I hope you enjoyed yet another story and a beautiful October evening from October Nights Part 2, 31 more tales for the Halloween season. If you can't afford to buy the book or you simply don't want to, remember, keep coming back to the channel, Homesteading Off the Grid, every night for the month of October, and listen to the stories. See you for the next one tomorrow night. <laughs>